I'll be uh, talking mainly uh, as it relates to us as Canadians rather than other studies, you know. Uh, vitamin D, D deficiency, what, what are the implications for the Canadians? I'll be covering vitamin D deficiency uh, and reviewing this in the context of the recent IOM report which was released during the last six months and has caused nothing but confusion. And I think it's uh, not a very good report We'll find out when we look at it. Okay, the Institute of Medicine report on vitamin D and calcium showed that scientific evidence uh, indicates that calcium and vitamin D play key roles in bone health. Well, I guess we've heard that today, and we know that. And uh, they suggested increasing the vitamin D levels from 200 to 600 international units from the age 1 to 70, and uh, 800 international units after the age of 70. That's almost tripling what they had as earlier recommendations. Good move. Increase the margin of safety from 2,000 to 4,000. That's also a good move, but it's nowhere close to where it should be. The Canadian Osteoporosis Society came out with a report right around the same time. And they said people over 50 need uh, 800 international units of vitamin D. So there's not even a consensus amongst the uh, specialists who are looking at all of these things in review. There's a controversy that the IOM report has, and that is, uh, they say that with few exceptions, all North Americans are receiving enough vitamin D. And that was an assumption that everybody should have levels of 15 animals per liter. Now, when you looked at what we just heard today, we should all be over 100, right? Or even 125, preferably, if you want to avoid cancer. And I'll get into that a little bit later. So. This is really low. I'm very appreciative of our lab here in Alberta. At least when we get our lab report back, it says 80 nanomoles is sufficient. So they're closer to the truth. And we do have very good experts there, and I'm appreciative of what they've done. So let's explore this a little bit. We heard about sunlight. Well, if you get about five hour, eight hours of sunlight a week, you can have a level of 68 nanomoles per liter. If you're a lifeguard, you have a level of 161 nanomoles per liter. So we were naked and unashamed, <laughs> then we sinned, then we covered up with clothes, and since then we've been sick. <laughs> so what are the levels of vitamin D in Canada? Uh, by the way, you know, the lifeguards are the ones that are pretty close to naked. So and levels of vitamin D in Canada, uh, if we're using a level of 50, which the IOM report suggests, uh, 35 to 50 percent of Canadians are deficient in the winter time. I did an analysis of about 19 studies that were done in Canada looking at the levels, including the uh, uh, National uh, Home study that the uh, government did, about two of them, I guess, over the last five years, looking at levels of vitamin D. And about 10 to 20 percent have levels less than 50 nanomoles even in the summer. Are Albertans deficient in vitamin D? Well, Dr. Hanley did a very nice study back in uh, 2000, well, before 2001, and showed that uh, at the level of 40 nanomoles, 34% of people in Alberta are low in vitamin D. And if you're looking at the summertime, even 9% of the patients were less than 40 nanomoles per liter. 97% of Albertans, at least at one time of the year, are less than 80 nanomoles per liter. So really we're looking at 97% of our people not getting enough vitamin D during the year. We did a study here in Edmonton, uh, it included a part of my uh, uh, practice and uh, two other practices here in the city, and we analyzed how high the blood levels were in vitamin D. And uh, at this analysis showed that 67% of people in Edmonton were low in vitamin D at any time of the year. It was worse in the winter and better in the summer, but not by much. That's because we sit at the computer all day or whatever. Anyways, dark-skinned people in our study were, had about 80% were deficient. Pregnant women, very important, they were very deficient, 76%. And lo and behold, the worst was the people under 19 years of age. Why would that be? 
Well, you know, they're using their thumbs, and they're watching the videos, they're sitting at the computer screen, they're not out there in the sun. So the committee emphasized that there are few exceptions that no, everybody's getting enough vitamin D. Would you agree with that? No, absolutely not. Everybody's low here. What about the IOM report? Another controversy is that the current evidence, however, does not support other benefits for vitamin D. Higher levels have not been shown to give greater benefits and in fact have been linked to other health problems, challenging the concept that more is better. That was in their study. I want to digress a bit here and look at what does vitamin D do? Dr. Um, um, Reinhold Wieth in Toronto looked at, with a bunch of other researchers as to how many genes does vitamin D actually influence. That's really important because we're going to look at the epigenetics, which means something controls the genes. That's vitamin D. It controls 2,776 genes. They did a full study and a full analysis to see how many genes were actually influenced by vitamin D. I know of nothing else that controls genes more. Um, basically, I consider vitamin D as the uh, master conductor of the orchestra of our genes. So it, will, it turns them on when you need them, it turns them off when you need them, it does all these wonderful things that we were not aware of until recently. I'll digress a little bit here. I want to talk about radiation. And we've heard a lot about uh, uh, some scary things about having to use iodine for our thyroid to protect it. What protects your whole body from uh, ionizing radiation? Well, vitamin D does. It's been shown to protect and prevent us from getting cancer because it, it keeps the uh, um, it prevents DNA breaks, it sits on the DNA and it actually protects it. When you have an abnormal cell, that cell should be programmed for cell death, right? Because it's going to become a cancerous cell. It's been found that if you use vitamin D along with radi radiation therapy that you can actually induce the destruction of the cancerous cell. So it does two things nicely. One of them, it protects you from radiation that you are being exposed to. And the second thing it does is it, protect, it actually enhances your chemotherapy or, cat or your radiation therapy. Wow, who would ever think of do those things all at once? The CMAJ just came out with an article last month that if you're having some cardiac imaging done, you increase your risk of developing cancer over the next five years by about three or five percent. How can you protect yourself? You can protect yourself by having adequate levels of vitamin D. What about macular degeneration? Second common, most common cause of blindness. It's increasing because we're all getting older and you can protect your eyes actually with vitamin D. It reduces your incidence of getting macular degeneration by 36%. That's, that's huge. This is a very complicated slide. It's something that I uh, have in one of the articles that I've written, and it talks about how vitamin D acts. If you look at the blue outlined area, that's basically what you know, the IOM report says. This is where vitamin D works. There's tons more. You know, we talked about muscle cells, we talked about insulin, we talked about the skin, and we talked about cancer, and there's a huge area that I just want to spend a little bit of time on, which is the immune system. What does it actually do in the immune system? So, vitamin D is required for healthy immunity. Vitamin D is required for strong barrier function, for antimicrobial production. Hold it, hold it, wait a minute, is, that's antibiotics. Your own natural body makes its own anti antibiotics to fight off all kinds of infection. And it also increases the hydrogen peroxide, which is just kills off bacteria and all kinds of things. And lastly, it also prevents an overreaction of your body, which is often the thing that kills you when you're fighting off an infection, because you get so inflamed that the inflammation kills you. So, vitamin D, um, in order to have the barrier of the gut 
and the lung and the urinary tract and the skin to provide the functioning that it needs, you need to have very good junctions between your cells. They have to be sticky and they have to be able to communicate with each other. Vitamin D upregulates all of the genes that are responsible for this. If you don't have enough vitamin D, the cells start to get unsticky. We heard about that. So what about the antimicrobial aspect of vitamin D? These peptides that we ha can produce kill bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And that's why we see those results that we saw in some of those studies that were being shown by Dr. Heaney. Vitamin D is, has a role to stimulate antimicrobial peptides. You do need enough vitamin D or else you don't make them. You're dead in the water if you don't have the vitamin D. So, what bacteria and viruses and fungi does vitamin D help to use catalyst iodine? Well, these are really nasty bugs. Invasive group A strep, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, pseudomonas, E. coli, TB, candida albicans, and envelope viruses. Not all viruses are, are helped by vitamin D. Some are, some are not. But you notice that this list is a really big list of the big bugs, the nasty bugs that we see in our hospitals and the ones that we are t t always fighting. How come we can't fight these things? If 97% of the people in the hospital are deficient in vitamin D, well, you've got a good reason. This is sort of a schematic that shows you how it works. You have that invading organism, it has some a pathogen associated molecular patterns that are found on bacteria, viruses and fungi and they're not found on your body and this stimulates your immune system to make inactive vitamin D, to active vitamin D which then goes to the genes uh, and, then uns uh, and it transcribes all of the, the right um, things so that you make cathelicidins and the cathelicidin actually then kills your bacteria, fungus or virus. That's really cool. That's only been known for the last three to four years that this is the mechanism of how it works. There has to be a reason for all this. So, when we're looking and review, the innate immune system uh, is able to respond within minutes with this particular uh, graphic that I showed you to an offending organism. Not like your flu shot, which you get today, and in two weeks' time you have adequate protection against the flu, because that's not the innate immune system, it's the adaptive immune system that you're trying to stimulate. Innate immune system is your first line of defense. It's what kills it right off the bat. Um, it's a regulator of these target genes, and the cathelicidins are produced in response to the insult, and then the immunity does not demonstrate memory, which is what the adaptive immune system does do that. Okay, so if you get a flu shot, you get the adaptive immune system uh, triggering the antibodies against that particular organism, and guess what? You will do better, you know, the next time you, you see that organism. But when it comes to the innate immune system, it does not have memory, so this has to be triggered each time that you have the infection, should it be the same infection. Vitamin D also uh, upregulates defenses and cathelicidin production in response to the bacteria and fungi, and it downregulates the, uh, uh, the B cell and macrophage responses, and the inflammatory cytokines are reduced by vitamin D. I just want to digress a little bit because that was a little bit of heavy stuff the last three or four slides. Uh, when we're talking about sweat, uh, cathelicidin is actually produced in sweat. Don't you often wonder what kind of bugs a person's just given you when you shake that sweaty hand? You know, I'm sort of, uh, I still don't like shaking a sweaty hand, but this knowledge certainly reassures me that most of those bugs have been killed by the cathelicidin that we find in the, in the sweat. However, if you're deficient in vitamin D, uh, we won't go there. 